So this is largely review, things that you probably know already. Doesn't mean it's not exciting. We want to review what, um, or we want to preface this course with, no problem. It'll be in the video, I'm that's good. That's fine, that's fine. Um, we want to preface this course and figure out what it is we're about to learn. What, what do we interpret or what do we think clinical exercise physiology is? And so, to unpack this more complicated term, we could uh, move back, regress, and try to figure out what the individual pieces of clinical exercise physiology is a spin on exercise physiology. Exercise physiology is a spin on just physiology. So if we can understand the roots of at least this phrase, we might be able to understand what we're hoping to learn. So you probably haven't articulated this before. Maybe you've thought about it, maybe not, but good morning. What would you say, how would you describe physiology? What would you say physiology is? It's part of what we're studying in class. It's a word you've heard before. What does it mean, though? The uh, second half of physiology, logia, means the study of biology, biology, not chemistry. What else is out there? What other ologies are there? Anyways, ology is the study of. So it's the study of something. What might this be the study of? Physiology. Movement of the human body. Okay, good. So movement is an aspect, it's an action that the body is performing. The human body I really like, that's definitely part of it. And movement is a, a facet, an area of study. It's an aspect of what we're hoping to study with physiology. But let's focus on that idea of the human body. What is the human body to us when we study it? It's a bag of bones and muscles. It's the human body to us. What does it represent? What, uh, what makes the human body? It's made of a bunch of systems that work together. Excellent, a bunch of systems that work together, absolutely. And to understand those systems, we need to know what, they work together, we know that, but I suppose instead of posing it as a question, I could say we know how they work together by the study of physiology. So physiology is the study of a number of different systems and how they work together. Physis specifically, the first half of that word, means nature or origin. So when we apply physiology to a system or to the human body, we want to understand the nature of that system, how it works normally, the baseline, the origin of that system. And so the body is an excellent example. We could consider the whole body as a system, many individual gears working together to allow us to function, many individual parts that complete the whole. We can have whole body physiology or we could turn our focus to individual systems. For example, cardiac physiology, the study of the nature or origin of the heart and how it works, or muscle physiology, neurophysiology. All these different individual systems that together make up the body have their own field of study. So physiology from a broad perspective is our study of the body as a system, maybe a system of systems and how they work together to allow us to walk around, to eat and harness energy from our environment, to sit in class and think about this as a topic, how it allows us to work as a human. So muscle physiology or cardiac physiology makes sense. There's a subject of that investigation. Exercise physiology though is different. Could you look inside the human body and point to exercise? No, there's not an exercise organ, right? 
Heart is an organ. Muscle is a physical tissue. There's not an exercise organ. Some people say that exercise physiology in its purest sense is not a field. There's nothing to study. Nothing physical that you can hold in your hand. How would you describe exercise then? For adding to this idea, the study of the nature of uh, a system, the workings of a, a living system, how does exercise come into play? Or how would you describe it? If, you, if someone didn't have any experience with exercise, didn't know what it was, how would you describe the phenomenon? And it uh, helps the system perform better. Helps the systems perform better. Okay, so better meaning what? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. You're you're actually jumping ahead to when we had clinical back in. So you're talking about stress and function of systems. That's good. We're gonna get there eventually. Let me pose this question: Do the systems work the same at rest as during exercise? No. Okay. How are they different? How do the systems work differently? How does the body work differently during exercise? And that might help define it. Okay. Blood is distributed differently. To what end? What are we trying to accomplish? Nice, very good. The inclusion of homeostasis, the idea that everything is in balance and we maintain um, we maintain homeostasis. I really don't want to use that word in the definition of itself, but we are trying to maintain balance of all internal systems within a normal living range, a sustainable range. Exercise brings us out of homeostasis. Why? What? is not within homeostasis when you exercise. That requires blood uh, to flow differently. That requires your heart rate to increase. That requires or dictates that you generate heat. What is it about exercise that is outside of homeostasis? What's the characteristic of exercise that's different from rest? Energy requirement? Yes, energy requirement. Sustained, elevated, energy requirement. Exercise physiology could be the study of the coordinated, coordinated responses of a living system or systems, all of them together, to periods of elevated energy. I'm using the word expenditure here. Expenditure and requirement are technically different, but they often are matched. You heard the phrase muscle sets the demand. Muscle sets the demand. So when you move to exercise, there's a stress at the level of the muscle that requires oxygen, that requires glucose and or fat, substrate for fuel, that requires a certain breathing rate. There's a demand that is then satisfied by all of the systems in the body. So muscle sets the demand. There is a requirement that is then met by metabolism in the muscle or ventilation at the lungs, or blood flow at the heart. So the study of the coordinated responses of a living system to periods of elevated energy expenditure. Oh, hold on a minute. Um, I changed this a little bit from the slides that you have online. I tried to make it a bit more, uh, a bit simpler, a bit more direct. Coordinated responses could be things that happen right now, or they could be things, adaptations that happen as you pursue an exercise training program over the course of weeks. One response to lifting weights might be that you gain more muscle mass or become stronger. That would still be within the realm of exercise physiology. But the acute demands are, are different from the chronic adaptations. They're all responses, though. And so then to add clinical on top of it, if we're using exercise as a tool to study how these systems work or work differently, clinical 
exercise physiology is the application of exercise and the study of how it affects those systems in the context of disease. So there's some baseline level of function. There's some altered level of function with exercise. And we want to see whether this stress, this, um, this um, tool that we're, that we're using, the stress that we're imposing, if it can reduce or reverse the progression of a given chronic disease. And this could be cortisol levels and general whole body stress. It could be liver function. It could be obesity and diabetes. It could be Alzheimer's. It could be depression. It could be coronary heart disease. It could be atherosclerosis. Any number of chronic diseases that are becoming increasingly more prevalent these days. So we are looking at how exercise can be used to treat those diseases in this course. Is it possible that exercise can prevent those diseases and or reverse those diseases? That's a pretty powerful question that we'll hopefully find some answers to. That's our focus. <clears throat> so then what do we want to do in this section? This is our review section. Now that we know, we've set our compass, we know where we're going. We want to talk about clinical exercise physiology as a field. Why is it a field? What does that field require? We're going to look at the development of the field. It's relatively new as far as medical fields go, if you can call it a field yet. In Canada, um, the scope of practice for clinical exercise physiology is dictated by, the, um, uh, by CSEP, the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology. It's a national organization that runs yearly conferences and many learning initiatives that provide accreditation certificates to individuals that want to be qualified in this area. We'll look at how we um, study exercise physiology. How do we find answers to that question? Does exercise impact disease? Which is a brief review of um, research methods, nothing too in-depth. And then I'll just quickly uh, articulate a small difference that I feel is important for physical activity versus exercise. They're not usually interchangeable. They are points along the same spectrum, but they don't, oh, well, they might overlap a little bit. Generally, they are different. We'll talk about what those mean at the end of this section. So this course used to be a how to CEP course. How do you become qualified? What do you need to be in order to be a person that's accredited? But with the addition of the lab, we've really changed it to um, what does exercise do? It's a study of exercise as the subject, not the person as the subject, if that makes sense. We're interested in the phenomenon of exercise in this course moving forward. So being that we are studying disease, what diseases could exercise impact? The diseases in question that are a public health concern now that exercise seems to be most beneficial in treating are non-communicable diseases, or what we often refer to as chronic disease, modern chronic disease. In the past, disease was binary. You had polio or you didn't. You had the black plague or you didn't. You had chickenpox or you didn't. Now, modern disease is not so binary. It's a spectrum. There's a progression towards a general failing of systems in the body or a reduced function of systems in the body. Things don't often stop in their tracks and you have this disease. Now there's a progression towards being more insulin resistant to becoming diabetic. Most chronic diseases exhibit this spectrum nature. Non-communicable um, non disease, modern chronic disease, things like obesity can't be communicated from one person to another. The flu can, obesity can't. Um, polio or other viruses generally can be communicated, but uh, diabetes can't. 
coronary heart disease can't. So modern chronic disease are dysfunctional, incurable, controllable, and multifactorial in that some system doesn't work properly. I often default to using insulin resistance and diabetes as my example because that was one of the chronic diseases that I studied most in, um, in my doctor. So a system is dysfunctional. We don't have the same baseline ability to respond to circulating glucose. That system is impacted by some number of factors and we're hoping that exercise can improve and impact um, that dysfunction. These diseases are incurable, so they can't be cured. There's no pill that you can take to say, I was insulin resistant, now I'm not, I'm cured. There's no point in time to contract the disease. And there's no point in time where you can say that you've been cured of the disease. It's a process, but they are controllable. We can use tools like surgery or medication or exercise as an aspect to control the symptoms and progression of these diseases. And I think the, the, uh, the spectral nature, if you will, of these uh, diseases, the progression and the tendency for them to accrue over time, symptoms to accrue over time, is that these diseases are multifactorial. There isn't one particular deficit. There's not one thing that goes wrong that causes this disease. You can think of these as almost diseases of lifestyle, the gradual accumulation of bad habits over time causes the erosion of normal function of these body systems. And being that they're multifactorial, that kind of explains why there's no silver bullet. There's not one pill that you can take to target a specific system and be cured. <clears throat> multifactorial disease often requires a multifactorial solution. And the good news there is that exercise is a multifactorial solution. It activates the nervous system, the lungs, the heart, the vasculature, the muscles, the bones are stressed, hormones, exercise gets all of these systems uh, activated that might hopefully address these multiple factors underpinning modern chronic disease. Um, yeah, so this, this point really just highlights the idea that you can use uh, lifestyle factors, changing your diet, not smoking, using exercise, adding um, some specific medications that target um, different tissues in the body to help control and uh, modify these factors. So non-communicable disease, multifactorial, there's not an instantaneous cure. That's the kind of um, condition that we're discussing in this course. So there's a lot to know. There's a lot to know. And as a CEP, if you move forward in this field, you need to have a pretty solid grasp of anatomy and physiology. So where the organs are in the body and how they work. Uh, chemistry to understand how drug interactions might work with exercise as a phenomenon, how the systems are supposed to work together to understand how they're not working normally in the face of disease and or how exercise might provide improvements in the face of disease. And really what I consider one of the most important aspects is to have a, a wide understanding of the psychology, the behavior, um, on the psychology of behavior change and how exercise isn't easy. We know it's good for you, but we know it's hard to do. So maybe knowledge and being able to apply change in the uh, field of exercise psychology might be the most effective manner by which to use exercise to combat these diseases. But all of these fields come together within the umbrella of a clinical exercise physiology um, realm or under the umbrella of a clinical exercise physiologist. So wide breadth of knowledge that we can't fit into one course. 
And that's why this is not really a how to CEP course anymore. We tried, but there are two year master's programs that will train you to be a CEP. We tried, but there are requirements to have clinical internships. If you look at the scope of practice um, on the CSEP website, which we are going to do later, there's a lot more than you can fit into one four, uh, four week, four month semester in a course like this. Internships are required. We need a degree that you can specialize in, and then there's often an accredited examination required to become a CEP. CEP, when I, when I say CEP, I usually mean clinical exercise physiologist, but there are many different words or designations that we're going to get to later on. Certified exercise physiologist or exercise kinesiologist. There are many different ways to describe this profession, and they haven't been agreed upon yet, which speaks to it as um, a very new field. So let's try to understand this field. Where did it come from? Where are we at now? And where might it go in the future? And this is a list of some of the main influences on exercise physiology as a field and more recently clinical exercise physiology. This isn't an exhaustive list and it's not one that you have to memorize, but it presents some usual suspects that we'll return to often during the course. So we often uh, return to the Aerobics Institute longitudinal study. When we uh, present a new chronic disease, this looked at how physical activity and exercise impacted disease over time in a massive cohort. Really big study, lots of funding, um, and we get a good sense of how exercise might affect disease by looking at results from this study. One of the first examples that we'll look at later in class today of how exercise can improve chronic conditions was a Hellerstein case study to affect or to um, improve recovery from cardiac events. So bed rest was always the treatment of choice until Herman Hellerstein came along and ran his case study. We'll see the results of that coming up shortly. The Harvard Fatigue Lab was set up in the 50s. This is really interesting. It was part of a business school. It didn't have its own department. It wasn't in biology. It wasn't in chemistry even. The Fatigue Lab was part of the business school and its mandate was to study how to improve the tolerance of railroad workers in extreme conditions. They wanted to uh, progress the railroad across America and to make sure that there were no delays because getting the railroads running on time helped them with uh, trade and shipping. So I assume I'm not a business major, um, but the fatigue lab was housed within the business school because they believed that the functioning of their workers was paramount to impacting their business. They didn't care so much about the biology or health benefits, but more about the revenue or the bottom line. Now, these are all relatively modern. Some of this work was done in the late 1800s, early 1900s at the turn of the century, but really we can trace exercise physiology and maybe arguably clinical exercise physiology back even further to 100 AD with this fellow, Claudius Galen, who was a physician to the gladiators. And it's not gladiators like in the movie Gladiator. Um, they did have gladiators throughout Rome at this time and the Roman Empire spanned into Asia. Um, he was working for, I think, a Persian king and he got the job. Imagine this, he got the job by walking into the throne room, the king has a couple monkeys up on the, the throne and eviscerates a monkey and says, here, fix them. And so Galen, with his background, I, I don't actually know his personal background, but he has a, a pretty, pretty um, lengthy training in biology and uh, wound dressing, medicine, physiology, although it wasn't described that way at the time. He's able to patch this monkey up, the monkey survives, and as a result, he gets this prestigious position as a physician to the gladiators. With um, this changeover, he now treats all of the wounds the gladiators incur during combat. 
And in five years of his position, only four gladiators ever succumbed to their wounds and died versus 60 with his predecessor in the same amount of time. So whatever his methods, they were generally quite effective. And he always considered wounds as windows into the body and used these to develop anatomical reports, um, a study of human anatomy, placement of organs, and the functioning of the human body as a system that stood until 1500 AD when Leonardo da Vinci took up the torch. So 1400 years, his study of anatomy and physiology persisted as the gold standard. And these are some of the, uh, the, uh, the drawings that Galen produced, the anatomical reports that uh, were used to help treatment of various sword and axe and machete wounds, which is pretty gruesome. So when you get in the lab and you think, oh, this is really neat. These are applied labs. We're using metabolic carts and 12 lead ECGs. Think of uh, some of the applied physiology that needed to be done to, uh, to progress this far as a field in the past. No sword wounds in lab, don't worry. So we have this understanding of injury and disease and somehow we muddle through as a society with the help of some um, some uh, outperforming individuals that uh, we can improve disease we can improve um, survivability of injuries and we can study the nature of the body as a conglomerate of systems what do we know now What's different from this work that we uh, are better able to articulate now? And so I'm going to loosely call this the present, although the, the picture here might suggest it's a little bit um, a little bit later than the present or a little bit more in the past. What we know in the present, and apparently um, about 20 years ago, is still considered the present. In 1996, the uh, U.S. Surgeon General's report formalized our society's understanding of how exercise impacts disease. This was the first orchestrated attempt to summarize all of our knowledge, to say this uh, is why exercise is good, and this is how it can impact uh, the progression of disease. Now, since then, the message has remained relatively unchanged. We've had various revisions. In 2007, there was a really big revision by the American College of Sports Medicine and the American Heart Association that rejigged or retooled the physical activity guidelines to say, we now know that you need about this much physical activity, this many minutes of walking, this much running or cycling to be able to reap the benefits from a uh, coronary fatality, coronary heart disease perspective. And there are various spin-offs. This repackaged the same information from 96 and there are spin-offs for the American Cancer Society or um, any other number of societies. There are spin-offs to include the elderly and most recently CSEP took up um, a summary to help impact and uh, advise kids, young kids. 24-hour movement guidelines were generated specifically for children there are slightly different requirements for elderly adults and children compared to normal healthy adults, and so they warrant their own uh, guidelines and prescriptions. But generally, and we'll see examples of this, generally the message is what you've always heard. And we'll see that message coming up. All of these accept that there's some benefit of exercise. And I think me telling you that is not a surprise. You probably had that idea coming in. Exercise benefits health. It benefits disease. There's a generally reduced risk of developing many chronic diseases. So if you happen to be a habitual exerciser, more often than not, you have a lower incidence of heart attacks. It also, more acutely, can help reverse some of these diseases. So we take a clinical population into the lab and we put them on a treadmill or a cycle ergometer and we do that enough, we can see the reversal of some of these diseases. So we've 
generated a body of knowledge that says exercise is good in preventing and reducing the risk of chronic disease. Why has it taken so long? Well, like anything, there's a lot of policy inertia in play. If we know something at the academic level, instituting a change at the population level is a whole other ballgame entirely. And getting governments to sign off on new bills or new initiatives is even more difficult. So we've generated this knowledge in the early 1900s. We've added to it throughout in the 50s and 60s. We've repackaged it now in the 2000s, and it all says the same thing. What does it say? This is the executive summary, if you will, of the 1996 Surgeon General's report. The first major act to formalize our understanding of how exercise impacts disease. And it's a really long uh, document, so I'm only showing you the, uh, the first page. And I'm really only showing you the first paragraph. These three bullet points can be summarized as do something. People who are usually inactive can improve their health and well-being by becoming even moderately active on a regular basis. So do some activity. It's not no pain, no gain. Physical activity need not be strenuous to achieve health benefits. But if you do more, you're more likely to see a larger benefit. Greater health benefits can be achieved by increasing the amount, duration, frequency, and intensity of physical activity. That's nothing new, right? That's common sense. You've heard this message for a while. And even in 1996, we look down at the bottom and this paragraph summarizes it nicely. Given the numerous health benefits of physical activity, the hazards of being inactive are clear. Physical inactivity is a serious nationwide problem. 20 years ago. And that's a message that we still have today. One question that I'm not going to be able to answer but to think about is, why is this still a problem today? We've known this for so long. Why is it still a problem today? So this is the 96 Surgeon General's report. We have our own version in Canada. These are the CSEP guidelines for healthy adults. There are similar pages like this for the elderly over 65 years old or for uh, younger children under 18. And the guidelines are provided in this nice one page summary, which basically says, do this kind of exercise. These are all the reasons that you should and aim for about 150 minutes per week in the context of a healthy adult. So 30 minutes per day of brisk walking. If you only consider business days as part of it, which is a really manageable message. If the science backs this up, this is quite manageable. 30 minutes per day, not very much. And there's a whole host of reasons why you should. You can improve fitness, strength, and mental health. You can reduce the risk of stroke, blood pressure, types of cancer, diabetes, osteoporosis. All these reasons should motivate people to follow these guidelines. But often we fall short. Um, for comparison, I also threw up the 24-hour guidelines. This is that uh, most recent initiative for kids. Because even a one-page document with lots of words isn't so enticing. For kids, we want to make this, um, this message more accessible. And the 24-hour guidelines, these bars are set up to be uh, relative. The relative amount of time that you should spend in each of these categories. So sweating should be 60 minutes or so per day. Stepping or moving around, walking briskly, not organized exercise should be multiple hours per day. Sleeping, 9 to 11 hours per day sounds luxurious, I'm not going to lie, it sounds great. Sitting, two hours max. And if all of those fell into place, the 24-hour guidelines would, uh, would manifest as they show on the slide, but often these are obviously skewed. There's a heavy weighting towards sitting, less towards sweating. Who knows how sleep really plays out. But this is what CSEP deems to be reasonable or acceptable for children. So it's the CEP's 
job then to interpret these guidelines and then be the conduit, the point of contact for the general public or someone seeking to improve their situation and what uh, these governing bodies say is appropriate. What's the appropriate amount of exercise or the criteria to help improve that situation? The CEP is the go-between. And so as the go-between, they develop exercise programs, they help motivate individuals, they help them adhere to a program that helps to reduce the incidence of or reverse various <coughs> chronic conditions. And specifically, these are all broad in their impact, but some chronic conditions are obesity, diabetes, vascular disease, pulmonary disease, heart disease. And this is not an exhaustive list because the scope of practice for CEPs is not well defined. It's difficult based on how well you've trained to say every CEP should be able to work with a patient that has cardiac disease or neuromuscular disease. It's difficult to say that they've all gotten the same high quality training to be able to work with all of these conditions. I'm not gonna go through these in any, any depth. We, we touched on them briefly on the one page outline. These are the conditions that we know to benefit from exercise and they're long and lengthy and exhaustive. Um, and there's more to them, but I'm not gonna go through them in depth. Don't memorize them, don't worry about it. We know exercise is good for a host of different conditions. What we wanna know now is how do we function as the go-between? How does a CEP, um, how does a CEP work? What do they do? How do they apply this knowledge to the general public? And it really depends on where you are or how you've been accredited. There's no universal agreement on what a CEP should do, on what a clinical exercise physiologist should do. So there are in the US, the Clinical Exercise Physiology Association, the ACSM, which is um, a fairly large governing body for physio, occupational therapy, exercise physiology, researchers. They have a massive conference every year. This is um, the conference that uh, my student Hannah presented her work at in May, the ACSM conference. And they are probably the closest analogous body in the States to the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology in Canada. Those are generally uh, the two bodies that are most alike I, I suppose, in my opinion. So each of these organizations lays out a different set of rules for a CEP. And they also call CEPs differently. So there's clinical exercise specialist, exercise physiologist, registered clinical exercise physiologist, certified exercise physiologist. You can basically mix and match those words and come up with a designation. So when I say CEP, being in Canada, a CEP is a certified exercise physiologist. CSEP dictates or gives credentials in the form of a certified exercise physiologist certification. Does that mean we should change the title of the course? No, it just means that we need to be aware there are slight differences, at least in the nomenclature, but the general application of their knowledge is the same. So as I move forward, I'm talking specifically about the CSEP CEP, at least in this section. We get very general as we move through the rest of the weeks. But what does a CSEP CEP do? And we'll get help from our two original CEPs before there were even designations, Hal Johnson and Joanne McLeod. Are you guys too young to remember these guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Body break? No? It's a really funny 80s uh, windbreaker wearing fitness commercials that were on uh, TV when I was a kid. Hal Johnson and Joanne McLeod, probably the pioneers of uh, CSEP CEP, in, uh, at least in Canada. If you look on the website, CSEP describes a CEP as someone who performs assessments, 
prescribes conditioning exercise, supervises exercise, and counsels on a healthy lifestyle to individuals that are either healthy and or with mental, medical conditions, including musculoskeletal, cardiopulmonary, metabolic, neuromuscular, and aging. So did we cover all the bases? Muscles, skeleton, heart, vasculature, lungs, the workings of muscle, brain and nerves, and getting old. That, that's most of the systems in the body. So a CEP, from the Canadian point of view, should be able to do all of those things. There is more detail, and I won't go through these in, uh, in a lot of detail because when we broke it out on that paragraph, you can understand how these um, come into play. So evaluating fitness, assessing uh, positive PARQ responses. So you know the PARQ plus, if you uh, answer yes to any questions, you should not engage in exercise before a certified medical professional clears you. A CEP has some flexibility in how they interpret those results. So based on their knowledge of disease, if a person has hypertension, but they're taking medication to control it, a CEP would allow them to exercise legally with close monitoring. Whereas a normal personal trainer would have to send them off to a doctor to get clearance. So there's some flexibility in the PARQ responses. They help with uh, clearance for healthy elderly and for youths. Uh, personal trainers normally focus on only healthy adults. They can interpret physical fitness results, guide physical activity decisions, uh, change and modify programs, sets, reps, activities, just like a personal trainer would do. So there's a lot of overlap between the uh, exercise physiologist designation and the personal trainer designation initially. They provide basic nutritional advice, but we're not registered dietitians um, for weight management and performance. And this is where it starts to diverge a little bit. CEPs can evaluate and treat symptomatic individuals as well as asymptomatic. This being a key difference between CEPs and personal trainers. Uh, people exhibiting symptoms of a chronic disease aren't immediately turned away. A CEP can choose to allow them to move forward with exercise if they deem it safe. And they can give exercise therapy to clients with these conditions. So this is another big difference between a personal trainer and a CEP. There's a bit of flexibility in interpreting the, uh, the existing chronic conditions or their symptoms. So a nice big long list of things they can do. The list of things they cannot do is smaller, but equally as important. They can't administer therapy to anyone who's been acutely injured. And acutely injured could be acute myocardial infarction is an example that we'll see, heart attacks. And we'll learn about how to diagnose those by reading uh, ECG traces. But generally, if a, a person presents with an acute heart attack within the past six to eight weeks, they are not advised to participate in exercise. A CEP can't work with them. And although it should make sense, it needs to be articulated, you can't diagnose pathology from an exercise assessment. You can't look at VO2 measurements or heart rate and say, you have cancer. Of course not. And anyone that tells you that they can is lying. You can't diagnose pathology from an exercise assessment. So this is what Canada has defined as their certified exercise professional, which I think is a pretty good designation or description. The question then is, where do we go from here? One, we need enhanced acceptance of the CEP as an allied health professional. There are some boutique agencies right now that will hire a CEP as part of team-based care or team-based practice. They're not automatically included in hospitals or retirement homes. So enhanced acceptance throughout the community, throughout the population is uh, one direction that we want to take the CEP credentials. We want to widen the types of patients that a CEP might work with. And this also requires then widening the, the breadth of training a CEP engages in. So maybe a three-year degree, bordering on a medical degree, depending on the types of patients you want them to work with. 
we want to continue developing professional uh, credential standards and or maybe not developing but unifying is might might be a better word across all these governing bodies try to figure out what it is we want a CEP to actually be to actually do and have training in <laughs> try to articulate it similarly so there's no disagreement between all these bodies and we want, obviously, although I might take issue with it, to continue enhancing the body of knowledge for how exercise impacts and can be used in the treatment of chronic disease. Of course, we want to keep adding to the body of knowledge. But this last point is like saying, if you were doing an honors project or a research presentation, and you said, this is what I found, but more work needs to be done. We don't have enough research yet. More work needs to be done. That's true. But it's sort of, it's sort of passing the buck to the next person. It's uh, delaying action. It's delaying a conclusion. It's saying, well, I'm not responsible for where we are at this point in time. Let's leave it for the next people to find more information. We really, we know exercise is good, right? We know that it can impact disease. It can reverse, it can prevent disease. We want to continue to know that. But I really think that where we need to make strides now is in the application of that knowledge, right? If we know all of this stuff and we continue to generate knowledge, that's great. But knowledge doesn't help people in the general population. Application of that knowledge does. So the most important next step might be in how do we motivate people? to follow this information? How do we get this information into their hands? Because as it stands now, our understanding is not very much different from 1996 in that first formalized US Surgeon General's report. And so I can't imagine it would become much different in another 20 years. The message is probably gonna be the same. And so as much as that sounds like bad news, it's not. There are some really good initiatives. This one's led up by uh, the American College of, of Sports Medicine. It's called Exercise is Medicine. And this is an initiative to help um, inform healthcare professionals, doctors of the benefits of exercise so they can counsel their patients directly. This is one mode of translation that is gaining a lot of popularity and gaining a lot of traction. And there are different branches of exercise as medicine. There are, um, there's some on campus. Uh, Dr. Kane is the point of contact for exercise as medicine at university here at St. FX. Um, I don't know what that exactly means or does, but it's raising the awareness of exercise being a therapy for different chronic diseases. And they often contribute to conferences like the ACSM annual conference um, and or CSEP. So it's all about increasing exposure of the general public to this information and hoping to generate some motivation. And before exercise as medicine, we had Body Break with Hal Johnson and Joanne McLeod. This is the, uh, the, uh, the commercial that you would have seen if you were alive in the 80s, which none of you were, right? No. I'll have to take the screenshot out at some point. But you get, you get the sense, right? That's a very 80s commercial. So this long-winded section has taught us what? We've learned a bit about what clinical exercise physiology is. We've learned about where it comes from. We can trace some of its roots back to physiology um, in its infancy, the study of um, how to keep gladiators alive, or the study of how to make railroad workers work better. And it's becoming a better defined allied health profession as we understand more and more how exercise impacts disease. It does, it's good, and we're learning about how much exercise is needed to bring about a certain result. And we're learning about different uh, conditions that are benefited by exercise. But we need, moving forward, to solidify the image or the role of a CEP. What is this person uh, supposed to do? What is the role of this person in the healthcare field? Should it be 
part of the healthcare field? My opinion is generally yes, but that remains to be debated and accepted universally.